On the 12th of December 1901, with the help of a 500 foot long kite holding up an antenna, the first transatlantic message was received in Newfoundland, Canada, sent from Cornwall in England. It was this single transmission that led to what I hold in my hand here today, a phone. But there's an Irish connection. And that story in this week's episode of Stories and Sips. Welcome to episode number 13 of Stories and Sips. My name is Barry Chandler, an Irishman in the United States of America, introducing the locals to the joys of Irish whiskey. Can we take a moment and bask in the beauty and design of this latest edition of Irish Whiskey magazine, which just arrived today? It's gorgeous. Each edition is like a book. It's so thick and so full of amazing content, incredible design, incredible layout. Uh, I am going to be spending the next few days reading this. Kudos to Sergios and the team at Irish Whiskey Magazine. I'm tired of telling you, go subscribe. www.irishwhiskeymagazine.com Now in the late 19th century, a young man in Italy had developed a fascination for physics and electrical science. And late one night in December 1894, he demonstrated a radio transmitter and receiver to his mother, a setup that made a bell ring on the other side of his room all by pushing a little button on a bench. Informed by what he learned from the experiments of famous scientists like Heinrich Hertz and Oliver Lodge, he had, despite his lack of any formal schooling, demonstrated wireless telegraphy for the first time. He wasn't an inventor, he wasn't a scientist, but he had cleverly brought many disparate pieces together to create this wireless technology. This young man's name was Guglielmo Marconi, and through the creation of his company, he would go on to change the world. A hundred years before him, a young man had moved from Scotland with his wife to begin a new life. He joined a distillery that had been started by his wife's family in Bow Street in Dublin to avoid excise taxes that were being applied to their distilleries in Scotland by the Crown. Though new to Ireland and within a few years, he had combined a number of Dublin distilleries together to form a larger distillery that he eventually bought outright from his cousins. His name was John Jameson and together with his son John formed the iconic Irish whiskey company Jameson and Son which impacted the world of alcohol for centuries. In fact I am drinking a little bit of Jameson cask mates here today in John Jameson's honour. But it turns out their stories are inextricably linked. You see 80 years after taking over the Bow Street distillery Annie Jameson, John Senior's granddaughter, eloped to Italy with her husband and gave birth to a son, Guglielmo. Guglielmo Marconi, the grandfather of modern radio and communications, was the great-grandson of John Jameson himself. Marconi's mother Annie was the daughter of Andrew Jameson, one of John Jameson's 16 children, who himself set up a distillery in Wexford in the southeast of Ireland, one of the few to ever operate actually in that part of the country. Now it didn't last for long, but he did try to continue the family tradition, but it was here that Annie was born. And the connections and the intertwining of the story don't even stop there. You see, once Marconi's discovery of wireless telegraphy became more and more well known in Italy, and then eventually around Europe, it was a cousin of Marconi that insisted he come to England, where he could help introduce him to influential figures and help him raise some money for his invention. His cousin's name? Henry Jameson Davis. Flush with money from his family's whiskey business, and he was based in London where much of Jameson's business originated, as they coordinated shipments of whiskey all over the British Empire, Henry worked as an engineer for Jameson. And Marconi took up his offer, and he joined his cousin, who made important introductions in London for his cousin, who was becoming increasingly more well known for his incredible scientific breakthrough. Recognizing the importance of his cousin's work and its potential, both financially and to the world, Henry Jameson Davis proposed that they form a company. And he proposed that they do that so that they could raise money while Marconi, his cousin, furthered his research and developed the technology a little bit further. Marconi agreed and it was Henry Jameson Davis together with seven Irish corn merchants that set up the Wireless Telegraphy and Signal Company which was later renamed Marconi's Wireless Telegraph Company. The company was completely funded by whiskey money. Don't ever let anyone tell you that a radio is powered by a battery. It's powered by whiskey. 
The funding was only the beginning of Marconi's work, and indeed only the start of what was to be a long relationship with his mother's homeland of Ireland. You see, Marconi dreamed one day of being able to transmit all the way across the Atlantic, and he saw Ireland as a really key location for his experiments. So he built two transmission stations in Ireland, one at Ross Lair in Wexford, and uh, another in Clifton and Galway. And then he built another in Poldhu in Cornwall, and the other one in uh, St. John's in Newfoundland, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And these stations would be how he intended to connect the continents. So using a 500 foot kite supporting antenna in Newfoundland, the first cross-Atlantic message was received on the 12th of December, 1901. And the message was just a series of three clicks, the Morse code for the letter S. And it was most likely the beginning of the sentence, send more whiskey which he would have needed on a cold night in Newfoundland. But by 1904, he had progressed and he had launched a commercial service to communicate with ships at sea, and daily news was transmitted to passenger ships, which were then reprinted on board on their onboard newspapers, something that's still done today, and I can attest to that, having worked on ships for several years myself. But by 1907, he had a regular transatlantic service from Canada to Clifton and, Clifton and Galway. And in a further hat tip to Ireland to deepen the connection, Marconi married Beatrice O'Brien, Lord Inchiquin's daughter from Dromolan Castle in County Clare. Now, it wasn't an easy marriage with him permanently travelling for his experiments and her abandoned as he pursued even more scientific breakthroughs, but the marriage lasted for a few years. And Marconi's ties with Ireland were deep, not only through his mother and his wife or his experimental communication stations, but he heavily relied on Irish expertise in his company. In fact, all of the directors of his company were Irish. Now Marconi achieved extraordinary success and his technology changed the world we know today. And even back in the early part of the 20th century, his technology was responsible for saving hundreds of lives in two famous shipping disasters connected to my hometown of Cove in County Cork, the Titanic and the Lusitania. Cove was the last port of call for the Titanic and it was where the dead of the Lusitania, which was torpedoed by the Germans, were laid to rest. And both ships used Marconi's wireless service to send out an SOS summoning help. It was Britain's postmaster general who stated that those who have been saved in the Titanic have been saved through one man, Mr. Marconi and his marvellous invention. And interestingly, Marconi was offered free passage on the Titanic before she sank, but he had actually taken the Lusitania across the Atlantic three days before because he actually liked a staff member on the Lusitania. And it was Marconi's company that led to the creation of the BBC in the United Kingdom. And when the Radio Corporation of America bought the assets of Marconi's company in 1919, they formed NBC. Now on every bottle of Jameson, you'll find a crest right here. Interestingly, with a ship on it, considering what Marconi's connection to ships. But it's also got the Latin words sine metu which means without fear. And it's the Jameson family motto. And Marconi wasn't a formally trained scientist. John Jameson wasn't a formally trained distiller. But the two of them, without fear, went on to change the world, for the better, I would add, in both cases. Lack of formal training didn't matter. They had a vision, and they had what it took to get it. And had it not been for whiskey money, we might not be today here transmitting on YouTube or blogging or using our phones or radios or any wireless technology. So I think that it's important that we keep drinking whiskey so that there's enough whiskey money to fund the next Marconi, wherever he or she may come from. It's our duty. I think it's our responsibility. And I, for one, have started already. Not for myself, you understand, but for future generations. Now, Marconi did end up becoming a bit of a, a fascist in his native Italy later in life, something we won't blame the whiskey for, but I'd rather end on a high note. In 1919, or 1999, Jameson brought their founder and their descendant together on a commemorative bottle of Jameson to celebrate 100 years of radio and the family ties. See, that's far more pleasant than fascism. Slaunja. I should text somebody in Marconi's honour. If you liked this episode, Enter Why Wouldn't You? Isn't it about whiskey? Please subscribe so that I can foist my opinions upon you and slowly, subliminally, and successfully convert you to the joys of Irish whiskey. You can subscribe to this episode on iTunes, SoundCloud, and wherever you get your podcasts by simply searching for Stories and Sips. And of course, you can see every episode in full Technicolor by subscribing on YouTube. And if you know a friend who might like Stories and Sips, then be a good friend to them and forward them a link so that they too can be converted to the Irish nectar. 
Sláinte.